Hello, everyone. We're going to get started. Welcome to all of you. Feel free to find a seat and get comfortable. Welcome to the in-person fall seminar for food systems, nutrition, and health. I am so thrilled to be in the classroom with all of you. It is so great to see you, and I welcome you wholeheartedly. Um, I'm very excited, obviously, to be back in the class, as you might be picking up. It's been a long time for all of us. My name is Dr. Yona Sipos, and I will be your seminar instructor. I've been um, facilitating and teaching this seminar for, I think this is my seventh time since I started here at the University of Washington. The theme changes every quarter, and this quarter the theme is fu the future of food systems. And really it's just future food systems. So really opening up an expansive, creative space full of potential and possibility, as well as hopefully a healthy dose of inspiration and skepticism. So with that, today I will be leading the seminar um, and just helping to frame up this, this topic of future food systems. Um, and I'll be orienting you to the seminar. So let's just take a moment We've arrived, take a breath, still the very first week of classes or the tail end of the, the first full week. Let's just take a moment to ground ourselves. You might want to take a minute and look around. Hopefully you've been in classes last week and this week, have had an opportunity to be with other people, to be with other, learning with other people. And one of the things that we all share in common is that we occupy the same planet. We rely on planetary health and planetary systems for all things in life, including food systems. So it makes sense that we would start there. But it's also very important and very helpful to zoom in to particular places. And so I invite you to zoom in to the Salish Sea to the bioregion of Cascadia, to the Pacific Northwest of the United States, to a land that is known as Seattle King County, but a land that requires acknowledgement of the first peoples and of the history here since time immemorial. These lands and waterways that we are living and learning and working on are the traditional territory of Coast Salish tribes and nations who are still here. These are communities who have stewarded these lands since time immemorial. And many of us, myself included, are guests on this land. I have identified myself as an uninvited settler. You may choose to think about what your relationship is with this land, with this place, with the history of this place, the present of this place, and as we'll talk about in the seminar, the future of this place, using food systems as a lens, a way to look at a range of different issues. So I'm starting class off with a land and labor acknowledgement, which is often a very formal statement, I'm giving you one that's a little bit more informal. But it's a formal statement that pays tribute to the original inhabitants of the land and the many years of labor and stewardship that went into a space, into a place. The purpose of a land acknowledgement and also a labor acknowledgement is to show respect for the full history of life and to recognize people's enduring relationship with land and with place and with community. So in addition to the land and the original inhabitants who are still here, I also acknowledge the labor, much of which has a history through slavery, unpaid, underpaid labor, that has contributed to the wealth and prosperity of this land and continues even to this day. So land and labor acknowledgements are something that you're going to hear more of in this seminar. And in fact, our first speaker, first guest speaker next week 
Polly Olson, who is the tribal liaison to the Burke Museum, will be facilitating a discussion about land acknowledgements. And so I warmly welcome you all to be prepared for that discussion and to do some reflection on this place, this space, and your relationship to it. I also want to acknowledge that we are still in the middle of a pandemic. It's been a really rough year and a half. And it's still rough. So, first and foremost, if you don't feel well, stay at home, get support, get tested, reach out, okay? Be safe, take care of yourselves, take care of your friends, take care of the UW community. And if you need any support for the seminar, do not hesitate to reach out. The seminar is designed for your learning, not to grade you excessively on every point, right? You will go over the grading schema later, um, but just know that we are here to support you. We want you all to succeed and get this credit. More importantly, we want you all to learn, right? And to feel like you have opportunity to peek out some of the windows that we're opening, some of the blinds that we're pulling back for you, to recognize and acknowledge that there's a whole world outside of every single one of those windows. And we invite you, I invite you, and Samantha and I, who you'll meet in just a few moments, the reader grader, we invite you to follow your curiosity, you know, and, and to see what you want to connect with, what you want to learn more about, what you want to engage with over the course of the seminar. A couple housekeeping things, masks must be worn inside buildings and learning spaces at UW at all times, regardless of vaccination status. If you need a mask, I have them. If you're not wearing a mask, I will remind you to wear one. If your mask is below your nose, I will ask you to pull it up. Okay? This should not be news. If you have to miss a class, um, we will be recording every lecture, and those recordings will be posted on Canvas within 24 hours. No questions asked. Right? You all have busy lives and, God forbid, lots of things come up. Um, please check Canvas regularly. That is your responsibility. We will send announcements. We will send updates. But it's also your responsibility to be on Canvas, checking the resources, checking um, for the recordings that will be posted. Some of our speakers will be presenting remotely. OK, so next week will be our speaker will be here in person. But after that, it's on and off a little bit, depending on uh, lots of things. <laughs> um, when we have remote speakers, we will be broadcasting the Zoom presentation live in this room. So please come to class and you will have even the opportunity to ask speakers questions in the moment during their presentation, but it will be conducted via Zoom and broadcast into the classroom. And check Canvas before each class in case we need to pivot the dreaded word. Yes, hopefully there will not be too much pivoting, but please do make sure to check in with Canvas and look for announcements and make sure your announcements are linked to your email. Okay, last invitation for right now is to just open up your poll everywhere. So I feel like I should have taken a bet with Sam as to whether this is actually gonna work or not. I have like 50-50 or maybe worse odds we're using poll everywhere, but we'll give it a shot. And in just a, a moment, I'll start bringing up those questions. So just to give you a moment to get onto pollev.com forward slash SIPOS and get ready for a few questions. Um, there are no points associated with this, um, but we do want to hear from you. So that's the reason we ask for your participation. And basically today, um, we're going to move through the welcome and the warm up poll everywhere questions so we can get a sense of who's in the room. Um, I'll introduce myself a tiny bit more. You'll have a chance to meet Samantha Banks, the reader grader. And then I'll share a very short lecture on future food systems, on framing future food systems. And then we'll go through the syllabus and the schedule together. Okay. Let's see. Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. Respond. This is so exciting. <laughs> I know this should not be exciting at this point, but you know. I take the excitement where I can get it right now. So who is in the room? This seminar has been running um, before I ran this seminar. Dr. Adam Drunowski, who's the director of nutritional sciences, 
ran this seminar um, as the Nutritional Sciences Seminar for many, many years and realized we have interest from across campus generally. Um, so we'll see who's in the room today, but often we have representatives from most colleges and faculties from across the university. So we have, wow, half of our room is from arts and sciences. Nicely done. It is so good to have you here. And then just over a quarter from the School of Public Health, College of Built Environment, Forest, a Foster School of Business, Nursing, Pharmacy, College of the Environment, and a couple others maybe here and there. Great. So know that people who are in this class with you, in this seminar with you, are bringing different perspectives, right? They're on different disciplinary pathways than you. And there are ways to interact and learn and engage with food systems from all of those different pathways. Okay, wow, you're already on to the next one. This is awesome. So who pays attention to the news? Let's see where it's going to land. Okay, all right. So most of you are keeping an ear and eye on things, okay? That's awesome. I want to encourage you to do more of that, right? To consider, obviously, where you're getting your news from and to also reach out to multiple news sources that present different perspectives. Sometimes the same facts can be presented very, very differently depending on who's presenting them. But keep your eyes and ears open. This is a time of rapid change, politically, environmentally, socially. There's so much happening right now. And much of it you will find connection to what you're learning in class and to what you're learning in this seminar. The United Nations just um, held their first food system summit ever just a couple of weeks ago. So we're going to hear from the UN Rapporteur uh, special Rapporteur on the Right to Food, who is, uh, has a lot to say about how that summit went. He's going to be one of our guest speakers, Professor Michael Fakhri, Fakhri, I should say. And you will find that what you're hearing in the news, we will be talking about in this class. And I will welcome your input, your questions. Your, the speakers who come to present to you want to hear what is on your mind, what you're curious about, what you are needing more information on. Okay, so we've talked about food systems a little bit. <laughs> Who's in the room? How familiar are you with this term? Okay. Great. So, most of you have heard the term, <laughs> right? A good third of you are very familiar with it. Some of you are coming in cold. You are all welcome. There is going to be something for all of you to learn through this seminar. So just to start you off, though, what, in a couple words, in a short phrase, in a word, if you can, what does food systems mean to you? I'll give just a few extra seconds for this one. Great. Okay. Well, food is certainly central to food systems. So yes, right there in the middle, right? You are, you are all already engaged with and know about food systems, at least in that regard. And then you can see the range of issues that people associate with food systems. We're going to talk about many of these. Access, sustainability, consumption, interconnected, maybe interconnected systems. I'm going to talk about that in just a little bit. Integration, collaboration, connection, necessary, right? Some people say food systems is life. What else is there? <laughs> right? So food systems is so many things, and it will be interesting to ask you this question at the very end of the seminar as well. Last question for now. What do you want to learn about? Why did you sign up? Other than the fact that this is extra credit, you know you're probably going to get it, <laughs> the credit that is. 
But what did you come here to learn about? Beautiful. Food, right at the center, of course, as it should be. Nutrition, sustainability, systems, accessibility, sustainability, community, actionable impact. I love that. Solutions, meat. <laughs> we don't have a meat speaker this quarter, but um, anyone who's interested should check out our Nutritional Sciences Seminar webpage that has previous recordings from our, on our YouTube channel. And we've had some great discussions about meat in this seminar um, and many of these topics. You know, so if there are topics that we're not covering this quarter, you might be interested to look back on previous quarters and just scan the guest list um, because many of these topics are just, all of these topics are so juicy and require whole classes and programs unto themselves. Well, thank you so much for your engagement so far. I'm excited to learn more about you as the quarter goes on. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Yona, and I am an assistant teaching professor in nutritional sciences. I'm core faculty for the food systems, nutrition, and health major. And uh, I'm also in the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences. I didn't put it up here on the slide, but I came to food and food systems through many different ways, through my grandparents who are farmers, through their experience farming on multiple continents through their experience and their eyes as refugees who brought that experience of working with the land from another place and brought it to Canada where I was raised. Um, my PhD is from uh, UBC, the University of British Columbia up in Canada, in the Integrated Studies in Land and Food Systems program. And it is a program that emerged out of agricultural sciences, first and foremost, and then brought in nutrition, agrology, community engagement, and something I'm really passionate about, community-engaged scholarship. So the acknowledgement that knowledge, experience, and expertise lies in the hands and bodies and lived experiences of practitioners in the world who actually bring the food system to life. So I don't get to do um, research as all the time. My key focus is teaching. And so if you are in the food systems, nutrition, and health major, or if you take any of our classes, I will probably get to see you again outside of the seminar. This quarter, I get to work with a reader grader, um, Samantha Banks. I'm just going to invite Samantha up to the podium to introduce herself. And I should say, before, Sam, I turn it over to you, it's up here. I go by, she, I identify as she, her. You can contact me through Canvas. And if you need to uh, meet with me this quarter, then feel free to send me an email or a message on Canvas. I'm going to just do. Hello? Is this on? Let's turn this up a little bit. Can you guys hear me? Cool. Hi, I'm Samantha. You guys can call me Sam. I use she, her pronouns, and I am a second year MS student in the program of epidemiology. Um, I do feel like a first year student since all of last year was online, so um, <laughs> I relate to that. And um, I am exploring my research interest still, but I'm going in the direction of environmental epi. So if anybody else shares that interest, I'd be happy to chat. Um, and if you ever need any assistance with the Canvas or anything relating to this course, feel free to reach out, and I'm happy to help. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. And Sam and I, I should say, we're both in the School of Public Health. Maybe that's obvious, but just to um, spell it out, that epidemiology, environmental, and occupational health sciences our different departments are both within the School of Public Health and the Food Systems Program also emerged within the School of Public Health, which is different than a lot of places and actually provides a great opportunity to connect with even more issues um, to advance the sustainability, resilience, and all the potential of food systems. Okay, so let's move into our little mini lecture, orientation to food systems and to this idea of framing future food systems. So we're going to just start off kind of at a pretty high level, talking about what are food systems. 
We're going to talk a little bit about current and future food systems and some of the big ideas that you might bring to these, this big range of topics, the system of systems. And then we'll end up talking about all the details of the seminar, who you can expect as guest speakers, uh, what you will find on Canvas, what the expectations are in terms of readings and assignments each week. Okay, any questions so far? I have to remember to look up there. You all good up there? Yeah? Great. Okay. So up here, we have a food supply chain. And it's just a tiny bit more complicated than how it's often presented, which is production, processing, distribution, access, and if you're lucky, waste management. Boo. I like to reframe that as resource recovery. Right? This one gives a little bit more detail, starts to hint at some of the complicated relationships and pathways that actually exist when we're talking about food supply chains, which are really never linear. And so this at least shows you that there's some interaction and flow between the different component parts of the food supply chain. But essentially, it starts off with farm production. And of course, we have lots of um, agriculture and food that comes from our waterways as well, right? So lots of different kinds of farms. We also have lots of food and resources that don't necessarily need to be produced, right? That are, that are tended to, that are harvested, but that are not necessarily produced on a farm. In any case, here's our simple schematic, starting with a farm production, moving through different pathways for food processing, then the pathways through distribution that eventually get us to food and beverage services, institutional buyers like schools or hospitals, retail food stores, food banks, and all of the people that are accessing that food are considered to be consumers. Now, back in the day, whatever that means, of when food systems really started to be talked about as a discipline or as an interdiscipline, this was often the presentation of the food system, right? So people would say, this is the food system right here. Over time, lots of people have clarified to say, no, it's not. That's a food supply chain. But actually, the food system includes the drivers, the different influences on that food supply chain, right? And those drivers, in very broad strokes, can be classified as environmental drivers, socioeconomic drivers, natural drivers. Natural is a bit of a squishy term. Okay, but we're talking about things like climate, about things like politics, about things like culture, about things like solar cycles and tides, right? These are all influences and actually drivers on our food system or on our food supply chain. But you can see here that even here, they're referring to what is now depicted cyclically but it's still essentially the food supply chain, they're calling that the food system. But really, this whole thing is the food system, the drivers of the food supply chain, and then the outcomes. The outcomes are multifold. So first and foremost, we think about nutrition and health outcomes, which is why it's really helpful to have food systems in the School of Public Health, because we want to see connections with our own lives. So food security, this idea of people being able to access appropriate, available food is often considered as like the primary outcome of food systems. But of course, there are so many other outcomes. Right? What are some of the other outcomes of food systems other than nutrition and health and human health? Yes. Like what? <laughs> Soil erosion. So the first comment, thank you so much for being brave enough to go first and second. The first, the first comment was environmental impacts, right? There are outcomes based on the impacts of the food supply chain on our environmental resources, our ecological systems. So an example of that would be soil erosion. Great. Anybody else? Yes. Jobs. Jobs. Amazing. Yes. Yes, labor, right? So we haven't, you're, you're, this is excellent. We'll go right to the next slide. So here, finally, we see a food system diagram with people in it. 
<laughs> Who, who's driving that tractor? Right? Who's managing that waste? People. This is all animated. This is all actualized. That food is actually produced by hands, by people, by communities who depend fundamentally on ecological integrity, okay? On soil, on water, on clean air. But labor is a huge part of it. So here is a food system diagram that I like a little bit better because it shows food systems as a system of systems. So in the last diagram, we were hinting at that, this idea that there are drivers and there are outcomes and, you know, there are, of course, these different component parts. But actually, those component parts are all different systems. So we're talking about multiple interconnected, interdependent systems that are facilitated by people. And those people, those communities, those institutions that are made up of people, those multinational corporations made up of people, move energy and nutrients through from biological systems, through economic systems, to what has become farming systems up at the top. There are implications for health systems. It goes all ways. Political systems, social systems. And at the intersection of all of these multiple interconnected, interdependent systems, we have this space of potential, which is food systems. Okay, last one, I promise, for diagrams, <laughs> right? <laughs> because whereas I might have critiqued the first couple of diagrams for being too simple, at least you could read them, hopefully. But this type of diagram does not take the complexity for granted, right? This type of diagram embraces complexity. This is important for those of you who might be in engineering or modelers, right? It's often our urge to simplify, right? I was trained in a lab. Control all variables. Yeah. And then you take it out in the world, and it gets really messy and complicated, and worse than complicated is complex in terms of trying to solve a problem, right? So these, are, these type of diagrams and models are incredibly helpful for bringing to life the, the, the huge amount of variability of inputs, drivers, interacting systems, outputs, implications, but they're also really hard to read. But we'll keep this in mind as we go forward into food systems and just hold all of that from the simple to the complicated to the complex and let's think about why food systems, right? Why do we need to study food systems? Well, the Food and Agriculture Organization, which is part of the, the United Nations, says that understanding food systems, first of all, fundamentally means that you're employing systems thinking, which is university students you probably hear about from time to time, right? Understanding food systems and employing that systems thinking is critical to identifying the root causes of systems failure, failures. So soil erosion is a problem. It's actually quite a complex problem in many ways. But is it the root cause? So how many times can we go back with every problem that we can identify and say, but why do we have that? Why do we have that? Why do we have that? And try to take it back to the root cause. What is fundamentally orienting us toward a system that, where we lose our soil, where we lose what we fundamentally depend upon to live? So I'm not going to ask you. It's the first day of seminar, OK? But just like to hold in your mind, like you can all think about different system failures in all those different categories. There are an unfortunate and even devastating amount of system failures. That is not what we're going to focus on for this quarter. <laughs> there, are, there are many, many resources for you to explore that will bring this question to life for you, and probably you're already on that path. 
So we're going to do just a little bit of reorientation as we think about future food systems. We have to start with what we have right now. So I will ask you if there are volunteers who will answer this question. And the question is, what are some common features between these three images? I see a hand here. Uh, Mass production. production, Thank you. Monocrop. Monocrop. Thank you. How about up in the balcony? (laughs) No? (laughs) Yes. Industrialization. Was that a hand? Careful, if you like scratch your ear in this class, I'll call on you. Yes. Efficiency. Efficiency, thank you. High density. High density, awesome. Great answers. Anybody else? Yes. Destructive. Destructive. Thank you so much. So here's my short list, many of which you said, uniformity. These are environments where everything that can be controlled is controlled, right? And they're monocultures. It's the same crop or species being grown in massive amounts at a massive scale through industrialized processes that allow that to happen. There's a tremendous amount of byproduct that those farms and agribusinesses need to deal with, in part because there's a siloed approach to the inputs and outputs. So when those systems are designed, there isn't necessarily a whole life cycle approach to that design. The design is focused on efficiency. The design is focused on as much corn per acre as humanly possible with some help from all the inputs. So I have a very short two-minute video for you because this um, video called How Do We Feed the World by Asking the Right Questions is a bit of a rebuttal to this response that is often put forth to the images on the preceding slide, which is, but that's how we have to feed the world. How will we feed the world otherwise if we don't mass produce food in an industrial controlled way? So let's see if this will work. This video is um, by the International Panel of Experts on Sustainable Food Systems, and they were the authors of the reading for today as well. Um, And here's the video. The human population projected to hit 10 billion. How are we going to feed the world? This question drives policy decisions, guides research and development funding, and influences farming choices. It's a question that's used to justify producing more food at all costs. More factory farms, more monocultures, more pesticides, more bioengineering, and more data control. But the reality is that we already produce enough food to feed a growing population. However, much of the food we produce is wasted, used as animal feed, or turned into biofuel. The problem is also one of distribution and poverty. Many people struggle to access the foods they want and need. The industrial model of agriculture is actually the biggest risk to future food security. It's the primary cause of soil degradation, chemical contamination, deforestation, and biodiversity loss. It's destabilizing the basic functioning of the planet and putting crop yields at risk. So the question isn't just, how can we feed the world? We should be asking, how do we get food to people who need it in the right quantity and quality? How can we ensure fair livelihoods for farmers? And how can we produce enough food in a way that protects the planet? The answers are already out there. People are finding ways to sustain yields by regenerating the soil, to rebuild ecosystems by mixing different crops and species, and to nourish communities by reconnecting people to their food. So let's make sure we're asking the right questions.
So that framing, I think, I hope, will, will help as you think about the way forward for, fu for future food systems, but also contend with the food systems that we have right now, which are really diverse. So when I said, you know, that the monocultures were really emblematic or indicative of our current food system, they don't comprise all the space of our current food systems. And we're going to get to hear from a lot of different food system leaders and experts who are actually working in these sometimes called alternative spaces. But these are all spaces that fit into the current era of the Sustainable Development Goals. These are global goals. There are 17 of them. And researchers have um, articulated food challenges that could be addressed under each one of those sustainable development goals. And so I encourage you to really allow yourselves to see a lot of the problems in our world through this lens of food systems, if only for this seminar. Um, and then you can go back to whatever you're studying in your other programs um, and see how it fits, if at all. Yes. Oh. Thank you. Sorry. So that was a comment about my volume. How's this? Is that better? Yeah? Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. Yes. So I got a little too excited at the beginning. I don't feel like I have like the energy anymore <laughs> to talk about all the crises that we are facing. But there are many. Food systems are at the crux of many of them. Greenhouse gas emissions, labor and equity, food insecurity, diet-related diseases, major public health concerns. Even our current pandemic can be related to how we produce our food and how we, act, how we move our food through food systems. So we know the food systems is at the crux. We know that food challenges can help us get closer to addressing the sustainable development goals. And we know, as we started this class, we know that we are still in a pandemic. We are in a time where structural racism is finally at the center of many mainstream conversations, right, where we can actually acknowledge that as part of the triple threat that we are all living within. And of course, climate change, that every summer, every season is being exacerbated right before our eyes. And we know there's even more. We know that COVID-19 has made the problems, the inequities that existed even worse, have made, laid them even more bare have increased food insecurity for vulnerable populations by massive amounts. We know that food systems are becoming increasingly concentrated and that some of our food system issues of today are even being highlighted through that consolidation of power. We know that we're grappling with loss of biodiversity, loss of topsoil, loss of natural resources. There are conflicts around the world there's a lack of equity. So we have plenty of problems from which to start to explore these issues. You are going to be starting your working lives, if you haven't already, in short order. Uh, and you'll be working you know, through the next several decades. And over this time, the world will continue to change in massive and profound ways in our global population, in where that population lives, the environments in which those populations have the opportunity to live and work and raise families. And through all of that, there will be significant strains and impacts on our global food systems. So the reading for today um, was just the executive summary of a rather lengthy report, but it basically calls attention, as so many reports are doing right now, to this this, I was going to say pivotal time. I'm trying to avoid that word. What's another word? This, this time where so much change is happening and is on the horizon. Everyone's talking about what future food systems should be like, must be like, could be like. So this is one of those many different resources that are out there. I encourage you to take a look at it and really spend some time with it. They present two scenarios after they detail all, all the ways that we're at these 
critical tipping points. They detail these two scenarios, that we proceed with agribusiness as usual, with the slide of the monocultures that I presented earlier, or we look ahead, and they frame it as, they look ahead to see civil society as unusual, as a place full of potential, and that is where this seminar is going to focus. We are not going to spend time tearing down agribusiness. We are going to spend time lifting up and hearing from people who are working for other pathways. There are also incredible leaders within agribusiness who are working with communities for real change on the ground. They are not going to be your guest presenters, but they are out there, okay? Your guest presenters instead are going to speak from various different places and positions um, where they will be able to share with you research and lived experience about reframing food systems so that we're working toward future food systems that meet community needs. So next week I mentioned we have an esteemed guest, Polly Olson, who will speak to us about traditional ecological knowledge as a way to ground future food systems. The following week, we have a professor in food systems, nutrition, and health, Marie Spiker, coming to talk about what we mean by sustainable food systems. Chef Ariel Bangs talking about food justice initiatives in Washington State, increasing community access and ownership. Then we have Professor Michael Fahri, who is the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food, and he's going to help us think through the role of human rights in the food system. We have Professor Karen Levy, who will be looking at water quality, which is a growing issue of concern both in our state and around the world. Um, then we have uh, doctors Jennifer Otten and Sarah Collier, who are in the process of submitting a massive report to uh, the Washington State Department of Agriculture on, wa on the state of our food systems here in Washington State. Marie and I are both collaborating on that report, so they'll be presenting the findings to you. Um, and then we have an incredible professor from uh, University of Canvas, Devin Meheswa, who uh, wrote an amazing, pivotal book on indigenous food sovereignty, The Paths Ahead, looking at case studies and the potential there. Um, and we'll close out our guest speaker list with Dr. Eli Wheat, talking about carbon across biomes and how we think about managing carbon in and across different environments and throughout our food system. And then we'll close out really with uh, more of a discussion about what we're taking from the seminar and how we can start actualizing some of these ideas now. So I wanna, in the last few minutes, just orient you to Canvas and say that all the information is on Canvas. If you haven't been on Canvas yet, get onto Canvas and get onto the homepage, and it will help you to get to all the detail that you need, including the syllabus, including the schedule, um, and reminders that we will be having presentations on Tuesdays. So before you put your computers away, I gotta say, I'm just gonna say it on the first day. When we have guest speakers here, it's really, really distracting when people start packing up early. It's okay if you do it with me. <laughs> But when guest speakers are in the room, I would ask you to just wait until they finish to start packing up. Um, and also, if you do need to leave early, to please sit by the door just to not disturb the class. Um, and I guess I'll just say, because students have asked me in the past, if you are going to be doing other work other than the seminar, you can either maybe do that elsewhere and watch the recording, or you can sit in the back to not distract other students. I'm not suggesting any of you were doing that today. I just want to say it so that I've said it once, and now it's done. And you're all adults, and I know that you know how to be in a seminar class, and I don't need to tell you that. If you have any questions, communicate via Canvas with Samantha Banks or myself, and please reach out early if you need support. We are here to help you. Learning objectives, we have many. We want you to learn, we want you to engage, we want you to be able to ask critical questions, which is what you're going to be asked to do after, se after seminars. We're going to have, uh, for Nutrition, 400 students, most of the students in this class, from weeks two through nine, when we have guest speakers, you will be asked to hand in five seminar summaries. These are half-page write-ups of what you learned and then a question that you have. We will share some of those questions back with speakers. They love to get your questions. You're also encouraged to ask questions in class. 
You don't need to tell us if you're going to miss a week. Just know that you have five opportunities to, or eight opportunities to submit five summaries. You will have a final reflection due on the Monday of exam week, and it is a one or one, and a, one to one and a half page single spaced reflection on something that has been inspiring to you. This is all on Canvas. I'm just bringing your attention to it. More detail will come for the final assignments. We don't have rubrics up yet. Um, but the weekly assignments will show up in the Canvas modules. So in each week, we'll there will be a module with the speaker's bio, required readings, which we encourage you to read before class, and then draw on for your summary, and then a place to submit your weekly summary. Um, we, like I said, we want hopefully to open many windows to you and to see what resonates, what inspires you, what questions you have, and that's what we want to hear from you about. For Nutrition 500, we ask that you show up and that you bring your disciplinary interests and your career goals into this classroom space as well, and then at the end, you submit two or two and a half pages sharing some of the new ideas that are uh, that you've picked up in the seminar or that have been expanded for you, and also how what you're learning in the seminar really intersects with some of your career goals or future work that you wish to pursue. This is all um, on, in the syllabus on Canvas. Just a reminder of how things work. The final papers are due Monday of the exam week. Otherwise, those weekly submissions are due Thursdays at 11.59. We really... Um, I tend not to accept late assignments in this seminar. These are still extraordinary times. If you need to, reach out to me. But in general, know that you have eight opportunities to submit five. So if you miss one, it's okay. Um, check Canvas regularly. You already know this. And please, as of two minutes from now, um, Week two module should be live, and this is basically what you'll see with some required readings to get ready for um, Polly Olson's visit next week. And I think we're at time, people. Thank you so much. It was great to be here with you. Have a good rest of the week. Thank you.